later. So feel free to uh, check that out when it comes out and it will live on as a, as a resource for anyone interested in this topic going forward. Uh, my name is Jeff Beach and I am the uh, CEO for Asthma Canada. I want to welcome you to Asthma Canada's speaker series. This is our um, webinar uh, that we're focusing this time on AERD and we're very pleased to have Dr. Juan Ruiz with us today who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but before I begin, I just wanted to take care of a few uh, quick duties before I turn it over to Dr. Ruiz. Uh, so the next, um, apologize here, I'm having a little bit of technical, there we go. The next, I uh, wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement. So we are meeting virtually today, but uh, we want to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today in a virtual platform, we take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land in which we call home. We recognize that those joining us from across the, across the country are doing so from various lands and territories and that for thousands of years, indigenous people inhabited and cared for these lands and continue to do so today. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. A few quick housekeeping points. This webinar is, uh, as I mentioned, is being recorded and we will upload this to our website shortly. So please share if you will, if you think anyone in your networks might be interested in this topic as well. All of the attendees uh, that have joined us virtually are muted at this point. And we ask that if you please, if you have questions or comments uh, throughout the session, please feel free to post those in the chat or use the Q and A feature in Zoom. I want to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance. We had some really good questions that came in that uh, we'll be working into the Q&A portion. And, and I know uh, Dr. Ruiz has considered as he was finalizing his presentation as well. And uh, there will be time at the end of uh, Dr. Ruiz's presentation for questions. So please uh, submit them or you can ask them live when we get into that point of the um, uh, of the webinar today. So just uh, very quickly, I want to highlight a little bit about Asthma Canada and what we do. Uh, we are committed to improving the lives of Canadians living with asthma throughout the asthma community through education and support services, as well as education and advocacy. So a big part of our mandate is to help people live better lives and manage their disease uh, by taking control of their symptoms. So we have uh, a number of different educational resources, such as our Asthma and Allergy Helpline, webinar series like this one that you've joined here today. Our website at asthma.ca is a, a wealth of credible and evidence-based information that's available to you anytime that you need it. Uh, we also are committed to being the voice uh, for you and with you as far as asthma patients are concerned uh, around policy decisions that affect our community. We advocate on important issues like sustainable clean air and energy and choice and access to the broadest range of treatment options that are possible. We also support health uh, research in, into uh, better health outcomes for people living with asthma and respiratory allergies through our national research program. All of this is made possible because of our uh, sponsors and our donors. And I wanna take a moment here to uh, acknowledge the, the uh, companies that have sponsored this webinar series and also to all of our donors who generously contribute to help us with the work that we do. Quick plug here as well for the Asthma Canada Member Alliance. Uh, much of what we are we do, we have a small staff team, but a lot of what we do is through the strength of our volunteers and members of the community. People living with asthma, their families, parents, other caregivers, people who are strongly committed to improving asthma care and improving the quality of life for people living with asthma. So the ACMA or the Asthma Canada Member Alliance is a free membership of Canadians who want to be engaged in work that we do, who want to hear regular updates for us and have opportunities to get involved. So I would encourage all of you who are not part of the ACMA uh, receiving our regular updates and opportunities to get involved to please visit our website at asthma.ca, sign up, it's free, and it's a great way to stay connected with us and uh, on top of the latest around asthma treatment and so forth. Now, at this point, I want to, and it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our presenter, our guest for today, Dr. Juan Ruiz, who is a board certified allergist and immunologist. He has created many innovative multi multidisciplinary clinics to serve complex patients across British Columbia. 
In 2021, he joined St. Paul's Hospital and developed the Aspirin Exacerbated Respiratory Disease, or AERD, clinic alongside Dr. Thambu. The AERD clinic offers surgical consultation, aspirin desensitization, biologics, and medical management. Dr. Ruiz is keenly interested in TH2 inflammation, type 2 inflammation in the upper and lower airways, and he advocates for disease-modifying therapies such as immune immunotherapy and biologics. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ruiz, today, this afternoon, this morning, where you are, and uh, really appreciate your time, and I'll pass the controls over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen here, and we'll get started. Perfect. Okay. Okay, and can you guys see my slides? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Sounds awesome. Good. Perfect. So let's get started. So uh, we'll start with a picture, right? This is a coronal CT of a patient with sinus disease. You're supposed to see, let me look here, two, two, two pointer options. There we go. When you look at the sinuses, you're supposed to see black. Oh. You're supposed to see black. Um, in this case, you're seeing um, a lot of opacification or widening, which shows that there is something obstructing the sinuses. In this case, it's polyps and inflammation. And that's one of the hallmarks of NERD. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, as Jeff said, uh, I'm the director of the AERD clinic at St. Paul's Hospital. And these are my disclosures. So in terms of objectives, um, I think it's very important to become familiar with the diagnosis and management of NERD. I'll tell you about some of the advances on AERD therapeutics. And very importantly, uh, I'd like to promote patient advocacy because I think that part is very important and that's something that Asthma Canada does greatly. So language is very important. Having definitions, words are extremely important to classify disease. Unfortunately, in the cases of NERD or AERD, there's many names for the same disease. This disease goes by Samter's triad or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease because initially it was um, described as a severe asthma attack and sinus issues after taking aspirin. But more recently, the change was the name was changed to NERD, which is NSAID or uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory exacerbated respiratory disease. At the end of the day, all these titles are the same thing. We're talking about the same disease. And I think as, as we move forward, the NERD um, name is, is, is taking over. But just so, so you know, as you're reading about um, this disease, it'll go by different names. So, What's the triad? What are the three conditions that make up this disease? Um, oh. First is asthma, which is issues with your lungs, inflammation. It can present as coughing, wheezing, difficulty breathing. Then there is the NSAID uh, or anti-inflammatory allergy or hypersensitivity. And lastly is the sinusitis or sinus inflammation with polyps. So those are the three markers of this disease and the, the, the three diseases within the disease that we're going to be talking about today. So let's start with a little bit of history. This is the famous case series from Max Samters and Ray Beers that first described the triad, right? What's um, interesting in, in, in this case is that there was actually previous literature from the early 1900s. So around 1902, I think that's when the first um, case of aspirin uh, exacerbated disease was described. There was a case series that came out of France in 1922, and it took almost 40 years before this kind of hit the mainstream academia in North America and in Europe. So there was a 40 year lag period from when this disease was first described in a case series till it kind of made it into a mainstream. And I still think that today, a lot of uh, physicians who are outside the asthma allergy realm have might not have heard of this disease. 
So yeah, that's that's kind of what, what what I was saying. Now, one thing that was interesting here is um, in between that period from the 1930s to like 1968, before this um, uh, case series was unveiled, there's several deaths reported with aspirin. Patients with NERD who were not diagnosed would accidentally take large doses of anti-inflammatories and would have a severe bronchospasm and eventually have um, a, a respiratory arrest. So let's look at this case series in more detail because this is this still holds today. So they recruited um, around 180-ish patients. Most of them were female, and we still see that today. The, the, the disease tends to be predominantly female. Uh, most of them had nasal polyps, as you can see. A lot of them, about 14 of them, had reactions to alcohol, which is something that we see, a lot more congestion, asthma, um, flare-ups. And most of them had had a reaction to aspirin. So that's kind of the group that they that they uh, screened. Now, here, uh, in this case series, they talked a little bit about a food allergy, part particularly tartrazine uh, or cosmetic yellow dye. That was initially placed on, on the initial case series, but further work has kind of disproven that yellow foods uh, actually trigger NERD, but that's something that you might see um, on your reading. So let's start with the first element of the NERD, which is the NSAID hypersensitivity. So NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so they bring down inflammation. And the way they do it is by inhibiting COX-1 or cyclooxygenase enzymes. So in most people, they could take an Advil and it's fine. They could take an aspirin and it's fine. But in patients with NERD, uh, about 42 to 88% of them can have a reaction. The reaction typically is congestion, sneezing, nasal itchiness, coughing, shortness of breath um, in most cases. However, uh, some patients can have different reactions. For example, some of them can have severe stomach cramps and GI upset. Sometimes they could have flushing and even low blood pressure. What's interesting about these reactions that makes them a bit harder to diagnose is that they can be delayed. Sometimes it could be within 30 minutes, but in some cases it could be up to three hours after the ingestion. So sometimes patients might not clue in that they took an ibuprofen at noon and at three o'clock, they're wheezing and they end up in the merge, they might not make the connection right away that it was the anti-inflammatory that might have pushed them into that asthma attack. So again, um, that's one of those things that lacks awareness, right? Uh, I guess among common practitioners. Uh, so that's something that you need to advocate for yourself as a, as a patient. So let's talk about um, COX inhibitors. Uh, so NSAIDs. So most NSAIDs, block COX-1 or the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So common NSAIDs are aspirin, that's the original NSAID that we all know, but there's several of them. There's uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, ketorolac, meloxicam, methanamic acid. So this also adds another layer of complexity because some people will associate uh, NERD with just aspirin, but that's not true. Any anti-inflammatory that works through the COX-1 pathway could give you a reaction. So that's why it's important when I'm seeing patients in clinic, I will kind of go through the list of all of them, mentioning all the um, you know, generic medical names as well as the brand name. Some people might not recognize that Advil is ibuprofen, right? So I think um, it's very important um, as practitioners are seeing these patients to kind of mention all the names of these medications to make sure that you don't miss um, a potential exposure, right? That, 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 that the patient might've had. So again, these ones block COX-1. Now there's different anti-inflammatories that go through a different pathway that block COX-2. The one that's approved in Canada is called Celebrex and that is typically safe in NERD patients. So a lot of times patients with uh, NERD will have pain and they get told that they can have any anti-inflammatory. But in most cases, they, they, they should be able to tolerate Celebrex. Now I say in most cases, there's always a few patients that could also react to Celebrex because Celebrex, although it's mostly a COX-2 inhibitor, it still has a little bit of a COX-1 inhibition, which could trigger an event. 
Now, there is a dose-dependent reaction to, um, to the NSAIDs. So this is something that's very important to note. So for example, in this paper, uh, they looked at a 90-minute aspirin challenge desensitization protocol. They looked in the cohort of patients that at 40 milligrams, which is a half a baby aspirin, only 9% of people reacted. Around one baby aspirin, which is 81 milligrams, about 65 people reacted. And it wasn't until you get to two you know, baby aspirins that about 95% of people reacted. So sometimes a patient might have the polyps, might have the asthma, and then maybe they took a baby aspirin and they were okay, right? That still doesn't rule out the disease because you haven't had a proper dose challenge. So some of the patients with NERD might be able to tolerate aspirin in small doses. So you can see that in this study as well that most of the patients will react at the 162 milligram dose, right? Now, I think you can see some of the themes on this um, on this talk. NERD is a complex disease. And unfortunately, um, it the more you delve into it, the more you realize the, the layer of complexities. So we know that patients tend to react to COX-1 inhibitors. We know that there's a dose-dependent effect. However, if you do a study when you challenge patients with anti-inflammatories at different times of year, they might not always react. So you can have what's called a silent desensitization or a silent challenge when a patient might take the full dose of aspirin and not react on that day. So again, that uh, there's a variability to these NSAID challenges as well. So it's not a 100% diagnostic test. So in this study right here of 60 patients, they had 20 or 50 patients. Uh, most of them had reactions uh, during their aspirin desensitization. Only 16% or eight of them didn't have a response. Then they chose 28 patients to repeat challenges throughout the year. And they found that of those 28 that they repeated the challenges, 11 had different responses. So for example, you can see here, this patient right here, the first challenge he had asthmatic nasal response, second challenge no response, third challenge he had as asthma, right? So um, a negative challenge is not 100% like ruling out an NSAID reaction. And um, again, poses a bit of a, a, a challenge in terms of diagnostics of this disease. Ultimately, most patients will react, but um, I'm still very careful, right? When someone already has polyps and, um, and uh, asthma, to, to fully let them just have NSAIDs all the time, especially if they're, they're not using it consistently, just because of, 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 the, of this phenomenon of variable responses to NSAID challenges. Now let's talk a little bit about um, how this works. Um, the reality is that it's not fully understood um, how the pathophysiology works. What we know is that most of the... Um, NERD patients have elevated T2 or T helper 2 response. This is an evolutionary response that was originally meant to fight parasites, helminths, worms, um, that unfortunately is no longer needed when you're living in, in the places like North America. But then this anti-parasitic response unfortunately gets upregulated against allergens, against um, other stimulus, and it gives you... Um, an uptake on this uh, allergic cell called the eosinophil, which I'll show you here. So the first problem we have uh, in NERD and a lot of these uh, T, T2 um, diseases is that there's a break in the epithelium. The epithelium is just a fancy word for skin or barrier. You know, your whole body is covered in skin. Your nasal passages are covered with like a special mucosa type of skin. And the first thing that happens is that that barrier gets compromised. Now, we suspect that viruses, bacteria, allergens will have uh, an effect on this and activate the immune system to further break this barrier. But once you break that barrier, you get activation of the innate immune system and release of the alarmins, which are special molecules that tell the system to start ramping up the inflammatory response. Once you do that, then you get release of uh, a specific cytokines. Cytokines is a fancy word for messengers. These are special messenger molecules that tell other cells to upregulate 
to work harder, to make more of them. So the classic ones that we see is IL-4, IL-13, IL-5. These are the main ones that we see. On top of that, we get expansion of allergy cells, um, like uh, B cells, and then increased antibodies um, that also further drives the inflammation. So that's a, a quick breakthrough of the T2 inflammation. Now, in NERD, there's also deregulation of the prostaglandin and leukotriene pathway. These are It's a different pathway that goes through the arachidonic acid metabolism in which it further adds to this inflammatory response. So this, this slide kind of talks more about the, the dysregulation of the um, arachidonic acid pathway. So you have arachidonic acid on the top here, which is a fatty acid that comes from the membrane of the cells. And what happens is that in patients with NERD, they have an upregulation of cystinyl leukotriene receptors. These are receptors that um, can activate and lead to things like um, constriction of your lungs, increased mucus production, uh, increased neesin, polyp formation. There's also new evidence that uh, there's deregulation of platelets. These are the cells that help um, stop clots. Uh, and then they, they also participate on this um, production of leukotrienes. Lastly, you get decreasing of protective prostaglandins. So PGE2 is a prostaglandin that is meant to decrease inflammation. It meant to be, is meant to be protective. In studies, when they uh, looked at NERD patients, they noticed that PGE2 is actually um, decreased, uh, is not produced as much. And, for, and that's um, part of the reason why these patients don't have that counter-regulation counter to bring the inflammation of the leukotrienes down. So this is a, a, a simplified um, diagram that kind of shows you what's going on. You have arachidonic acid here. You have the cyclooxygenase 1 pathway here leading you to the PGE2. Then you have the 5-lipooxygenase pathway to lycotriene E4. So the green one is the good one, the anti-inflammatory effect, and it blocks the, the very inflammatory leukotriene E4. That's what the pathway usually does. What happens if you have NERD is that you block COX-1 with an anti-inflammatory like aspirin, naproxen, ibuprofen, and then you block PGE2, which in NERD patients is already being produced at lower levels than healthier patients. Now, once you lift that inhibitory effect of PGE2, you end up with a lot more leukotriene E4, resulting on the reaction of the nose, the congestion, um, you know, sneezing, bronchospasm, cough, wheeze that you expect with the aspirin. Of course, it's a very simplified diagram, but that kind of shows you that um, it's an imbalance, right, between the anti-inflammatory prostaglandins and the inflammatory leukotrienes. Now, with Celebrex, I told you, usually patients are able to have it. And the reason for that is just that Celebrex doesn't block COX-1. So you're not activating that pathway. And that's why most patients with NERD can have Celebrex. I still like to of offer them a challenge in my office just because some patients could still react. So I still like to have them monitor, uh, even at the GP's office, in case they have a reaction. So what about acetaminophen or Tylenol? Could you react? Uh, yes, you can. Um, acetaminophen is a N acetoparacetaphenol, that's the uh, chemical name, and it has weak COX-1 inhibition. So it may cause reactions if you go over one gram of, 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 of acetaminophen. So about 34% of reactions, 34% of patients can have reactions to it. So for me, when I do aspirin desensitizations, patients that react with uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen Personally, I think that they, they they tend to be the more the tougher desensitization because then they usually tend to react more. Because again, their threshold of we know that there's a dose dependent effect on COX one inhibition. I find that those patients usually are the ones that um, tend to react more during aspirin desensitization. So as the first part of the disease, the onset hypersensitivity. Let's talk a little bit about the polyps. So these patients have chronic rhinosinusitis. 
which is a fancy word for inflammation of the mucosa membrane inside your sinuses. They can have a lot of polyps. They have a lot of decreased sense of smell, which is one of the most common complaints with patients with polyps. They just can't smell. A lot of pressure and pain on their uh, forehead and in their cheekbones, a lot of recurrent sinus infections, green discharge, um, you know, fatigue. So this is a source of where the inflammation also resides. Now, this is a um, endoscope of a patient with nasal polyps. And as you can see, it can completely opacify the entire nasal cavity to the point where like, the air is not really moving in or out. If you look at a CT scan, you can see as well that they have tend to have a lot of inflammation, polyps here in the middle, as well as a lot of sinus disease. So uh, that's why the surgery is a very important management of this disease to open up those cavities and let medications get in. Now, the... Unfortunately, patients with some triad, NERD, AERD, they um, have poor outcomes when it comes to surgery. When you look at these polyp-free survival rates, so that means, you know, five years after surgery, how many patients have pol like are polyp-free, right? So regular patients, about 84% have no polyps. If you look at AERD or NERD, only 10% of patients at five years are polyp-free. And if you look at surgery free rates, meaning that you have one surgery, right? And in an span of 10 years, do you need to have more surgeries? Patients with NERD, only 10% of patients with NERD would be surgery free after 10 years compared to the control where 83% of patients would just need the first surgery and they're fine. So that's why it's very important to uh, have a team-based approach with patients with, um, with NERD. Because the chances are is you'll probably have up to five surgeries in your lifetime in the nose. And it's very important then to get it right the first time, to fully get the surgery that you need and to get the uh, medical therapy optimized so we decrease the number of surgeries in your lifetime. Perfect. All right. So now asthma, obviously um, there's been a lot of webinars on Asthma Canada. Um, asthma is a disease of inflammation in the lungs, particularly around the bronchus. You can have um, symptoms like coughing, wheezing, tightness on the chest, difficulty breathing. Typically asthma in NERD tends to be eosinophilic. That's the, that allergic cell that I was talking about earlier on. In a paper uh, in 2005, they show that patients with NERD tend to have decrease FEV1. FEV1 is one of the things that we measure um, to assess of severity of, of, of um, you know, breathing function. That's the ability to blow air in one second. So when you're doing a breathing test, they'll ask you to breathe really hard for one second, and they see how much um, air you can move. And you can see that in this um, in this cohort, the patients who had some, uh, sorry, a NERD had worse FEV1 after a bronchodilator. They also had more severe asthma requiring intubation, more in intubation and more um, use of the emergency department and steroids. So again, the, the, the inflammation on the lungs tends to be more severe. The asthma tends to be harder to control and these are patients who had recurrent admissions to hospital for asthma. Let me see what happened here. And then in this case series, they, they only found that less than 5% of patients had mild asthma. Now, I my personal experience, I think that number's a bit higher. I would say somewhere around 20% have mild asthma. But nevertheless, the majority of patients with NERD will have a, a degree of, of more severe asthma. Now, there seems to be a timeline in the way this progresses. One of the things that patients um, talk to me about is how did this happen? Like, how did I develop this? Well, most of the time it starts in the nose. You start with uh, congestion, kind of allergic like symptoms, hay fever. Usually um, patients can develop the sinus problems. So the inflammation, the facial pain, the polyps, asthma kind of tends to happen around the same time. And typically towards the end of once you have those things, that's when the aspirin re reactions happen. 
okay? So um, there tends to be a time now, this is variable, that's not the course of every patient, but I certainly see that there's obviously a timeline and the NSAID hypersensitivity tends to come last. Now there's other things that, that we observe. About 80% of patients will have reactions to alcohol. They'll drink alcohol and they'll get more congested or have more asthma. Um, and uh, no one really knows exactly why, because it's all sorts of alcohols, either, you know, sulfite, um, high alcohol like wine, but it could also happen with spirits, right? Um, now, some patients can get associated chest pain with high dose uh, anti-inflammatories. And some of them have hearing loss up to 28% when you can get polyps uh, around the um, a tympanic membrane. So that's something we always check. Now, there's a big area of food intolerance. As I show you in the initial um, case series, right, by Max Samters, uh, they, 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 there were some patients that um, voiced concerns about tartesine and um, yellow coloring. That has been disproven, but what we know, uh, no, we know is that certain foods, especially those who are high on omega-6, can't biologically increase some of these inflammatory markers. So, you know, I've observed on my clinic, some patients tend to have kind of worse symptoms when they go eat um, fatty foods, egg yolks, steak, they could report more, um, you know, worsening a flare up of the disease. So let's talk about who gets this disease. So it's about uh, 0.3 to 2.5% of the population mostly adults, and as I showed you earlier, is mostly females, about 60%. But it's common. Like any of these, not as uncommon as, as we originally thought. About 7% of all asthmatics and 14% of severe asthmatics. If you look at the sinusitis, patients with sinusitis, 10 to 16% of patients with sinusitis will have problems. We there's a paper that estimated about 1.5 million patients with NERD in the US, and then uh, in, in my opinion, I think we have maybe about 20,000 patients with NERD in BC. Now, one of the things for epidemi epidemiology that's hard, there is no, like a lot of these studies, they use what's called ICD codes, where you put a code to the disease, right? Like asthma, right? It has a specific ICD code. There's no ICD code for um, NERD. So I think what happens a lot of times is it's difficult to fully characterize how many patients have this because you have to make sure that that you have all the three criteria, right? And if there's not like a specialized center where all these patients are being referred to, I think a lot of those studies end up missing it. So you have to do um, other ways to find the patients. So they're, they're not easy studies to make. Now, lastly, some patients develop the disease in childhood. This is a case series from... Um, Dr. Laidlaw, uh, that showed that um, in some patients, they could develop NERD as young as 8 to 14 years of age. So these are kind of a case series of six patients, as you can see over here, and uh, they all had the NSAID reactions fairly young. The disease is indistinguishable with the adult onset, so still the management is the same, but just to show you that it can also develop early on. So how, we how, how do we diagnose the disease? So usually there's three criteria. You need to have asthma. Uh, and you need to prove it with a breathing test called an spirometry or a metacoline challenge. For the polyps, usually rhinoscopy or a CT scan to look at the nasal polyps. And then the uh, aspirin, or sorry, NSAID hypersensitivity. There's, you can do this through a history. If the patient tells you, yes, I took ibuprofen, I had a bad asthma attack, ended up on the merge. But a lot of times patients haven't taken anti-inflammatories for years. And that's often the challenge that I have. I had someone with, as with uh, asthma, with nasal polyps. And then when you ask them about anti-inflammatories, they haven't taken an anti-inflammatory in 10 years. So how do you know? If you remember, I showed you that timeline, the aspirin sensitivity tends to develop later. But if they haven't taken it, then you don't know. At which point the challenge is, is helpful on the diagnosis. So... There's several ways to challenge uh, or desensitize to aspirin. Challenge and desensitization, the protocol is usually the same. You give the aspirin at um, different time intervals and you monitor for disease. The difference between a challenge and desensitization is that um, on a challenge, you're just trying to make the diagnosis and you stop. Okay, yes, you're allergic, avoid. Desensitization is yes, okay, you confirm the diagnosis, they reacted, but you want them to stay on the aspirin chronically, ongoing. 
So as you can see, it's a high uh, amount of variability on the protocols. The one that I follow is the one from Dr. Laidlaw, the Brigham Women's 90-Minute Protocol, where they go every 90 minutes increasing the dose until the challenge is completed. And then usually you want to wait about three hours if possible after the last dose to make sure that there's no reactions. But as you can see, previous protocols had um, three hour intervals in between. Um, so obviously there's some variability, right? And then it's up to also the resources in your center, how you can uh, do that. For us, uh, we usually get to 160 and I'll keep them on that dose for about a week and then get them to 325 just because of the timing uh, at the hospital. We we don't, if you were to do the full day desensitization, somewhere between 10 and 12 hours, and we only really have the clinic for about eight, right? So we have to kind of make changes. What are other ways uh, to diagnose? Uh, there's a nice paper that looked at uh, fractional um, or like pheno um, um, or sorry, fractional exhaled nitric, nitric oxide levels after aspirin ingestion. So pheno or fractional nitric oxide is a marker of inflammation. If it's high, that means there's a lot of inflammation on the lung. And what they found is that at lower amounts of aspirin, like a, maybe 20, 40 milligrams, they were able to get an increase on pheno. And then that correlated well with patients who reacted, right? Who actually had the disease. So there's only the one paper, obviously it needs more validation, but um, that's something that maybe might be coming in the future. Um, other ways to, that, that might be helpful is if you look at the 24 hour leukotriene E4, that's also being validated and it's helpful, right? Especially on patients who you may not want to challenge. Let's say they have a history of polyps, a history of asthma, but they haven't taken anti-inflammatories, um, but you don't necessarily want to challenge them because let's say their asthma is really not well controlled. Then the 24 hour urine leukotriene E4 uh, can be helpful because if it's high, it gives you a clue that this would likely be NERD. Perfect. So um, we're going to move over to treatment. And this is kind of, I see treatment, right? Lifestyle, medications like steroids, leukotriene modifying agents, surgery, uh, aspirin desensitization, and biologics. So that's kind of what where we're going to start. So let's talk about lifestyle. That's a common question I get, like what can I do? That's not medication. So there's some evidence that the low omega-6 and high omega-3 diet can help. This is a study out of Brigham Women's. There's 10 patients over two weeks where they um, decreased the amount of omega-6 foods to less than four grams. So those are things like meat, like steak, butter, egg yolks, all seed oils, peanut butter, all that stuff, decrease that. And you can see discouraged and then increase things like egg, egg whites, um, leafy vegetables, raw fruits, um, fish oils or fish. Um, and then they did see an improvement on ACQ, which is an asthma score. And it's not 22, which is a sinus score. So it's a, um, a statistically significant uh, score. What I like about this um what I like about this uh, paper is that they actually looked at biological markers. Remember I talked about the urinary leukotriene E4 as a potential marker? Well, they saw that it actually decreased uh, on that, so which gives you, again, biological plausibility. And you also saw the same thing with prostaglandin D2. Um, so it was a, it's a nice study. Now, it's a small study, 10 patients, right? And it's only over two weeks, but it's something that I recommend patients because I don't really see a lot of downsides towards this. You know, there's a lot of upcoming evidence in other fields of medicine about the dangers of high omega-6. So even from their overall health, it's, it's not it's not something that I see a lot of downsides and I, I get all my NERD patients to try it at least. Now, the way they think it works is by decreasing omega-6 fatty acids, you have a decrease in arachidonic acid, which is the fuel of this system. So when you get less of this leukotriene for uh, activation, okay? Now, the other thing you may st stumble upon on the internet would be the low salicylate diet. This is an old study. It was at uh, 30 patients. It was a single blind crossover study. It was about 12 weeks. They had a lot of issues with compliance. So a lot of the patients were not able to comply with the diet and they did not have biological markers. 
Um, however, they did see some improvement in things like the asthma scores and uh, it's not 22, but it was a pretty mild improvement. Um, this has been something that has been falling out of favor um, just because it hasn't been able to be reproduced. So that's not something that I routinely or that I recommend in the low salicylate diet. Also because there's really an unclear mechanism because salicylates don't really interact with this um, with this pathway. Also, if you look at the low salicylate diet, it's, it's in a way some, somewhat similar to an omega-6 diet, right? It's a lot of fruits, right? Um, and, and then, um, so, so I'm wondering if there could be an overlap, right? All right, so let's move on to steroids, right? That's, I think, the, the main medication that we use. Steroids are like fatty molecules that can pretty much enter in and out of your cells really easily. And they go to the center of your cells and shut down everything, just like the picture here. So steroids are really good at shutting down everything. Unfortunately, they shut down a lot of pathways that are helpful for you, and they come with uh, significant side effects. Now, not all steroids are the same, and we'll go through the different ones, but it's certainly a, a good medication that has helped us manage patients with NERD. So let's start with nasal steroids. These are very safe. Uh, the absorption tends to be quite low. They help with uh, inflammation in the nasal mucosa, help prevent polyp formation and relapse. Typically, um, I prefer to do large volume irrigation with uh, budesonide nevules, just because as I show you, the disease on NERD tends to be deeper. It gets into your maxillary sinus, which are the sinuses behind your cheekbones, your forehead. So you need to get that irrigation to, to, to go in there. Uh, as I said, the the um the systemic absorption is small. I think the, the only time when you need to worry about it is when you're doing the MAD or um syringe application of the pomicord. I know some of the um ENT or ear, nose, and throat doctors like to load up the pomicord in a syringe and then just shoot it up, especially in patients with frontal sinus disease. It is helpful, but you have to be a bit more careful with that because that's been proven to, to give you a bit of adrenal suppression. But for the most part, nasal sprays, large volume irrigation is very safe. Now, on the lungs, again, there's lots of inflammation there. Inhaled steroids are the first line in asthma. They reduce bronchial inflammation, and then they uh, reduce active bronchospasm. If you look at the GINA guidelines or uh, CTS guidelines, uh, the standard of care right now is a combination of a long-acting bronchodilator, uh, which opens up uh, the lungs, and a steroid, particularly uh, something like budesonide for metarol, as needed at first, and then all the time. Obviously, there's a lot of different puffers, right? And that's probably for another talk. But the, the idea would be to open up the lungs and bring down the inflammation. That's the part that uh, is very important. Now, systemic steroids, that's where we get worried. These drugs work well, right? But unfortunately, the, the this pill of steroid will shut down a lot of things. So many of you who probably had polyps in the past, you get a course of prednisone and you feel great. Like the polyps start shrinking, you, you're able to breathe, but then you start having side effects like um, inability to sleep at night, weight gain, uh, changes in your mood, right? And especially those who take um, steroids long-term, they tend to have more severe side effects uh, as they go on. We know uh, from studies that once you get to two grams of steroids in a lifetime, you could start seeing some permanent changes. So although oral steroids are a great way to control disease when things are really uncontrolled, it's something that we reserve for the worst cases and not something that we want to be on permanently. So that's why you want to maximize the inhaled steroids, the nasal steroids, so you don't have to use the oral prednisone just because there's so many side effects to it. Excuse me, uh, Juan, just a uh, time check. Just one, yeah. but, you know, we're about 45 minutes in. Okay. Uh, or... so, and we want to make sure we leave some time. We can probably go over the hour a little bit. Okay, but... yeah, yeah. So let me just, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, let's go through here. All right. So in terms of other drugs, very quickly, there's the leukotriene uh, inhibition drugs uh, like Montelukast. I personally don't find it that helpful. You can see that in the Scripps Clinic, only 15% of patients found it. Um, 
quite helpful. And then there's an FDA warning about serious health, mental uh, side effects. So that's not one that I use often. And if I do, I will get patients counseled on the, on the possibility of, of these mental health um, side effects. And that's the study where this comes from. Um, in terms of surgery, uh, surgery is very important. And uh, finding an ear, nose, and throat specialist that specializes on uh, sinus diseases uh, or like rhinologies is very important because you'll open up the nasal cavities. I'll spare you this video because it uh, has a lot of blood. <laughs> so I don't want people uh, <laughs> getting queasy. So the surgical part is important. I would certainly like to highlight uh, aspirin desensitization. Uh, so this is the protocol that we talked about. You know, aspirin doses increase every 90 minutes. It's important to do breathing tests in between to make sure that the doses of, um, that the lung function doesn't drop. Because what happens is, when you're doing aspirin desensitization, especially in young people, they're not really have they don't have good awareness of their symptoms, so they will notice that they might not notice that their FEV1 is dropping, and then you'll give them the next dose, and they could get into a, a really bad asthma attack. So that's why you have to check the breathing uh, in between each dose, and then if it drops, then you have to treat it and wait for it to recover. I like to premedicate with Montelukast, um, and sometimes with prednisone. Um, and then usually you stay on the aspirin ongoing. Uh, we talked about some of the side effects, most of it being nasal congestion and asthma attacks, but sometimes um, there could be um, severe abdominal pain. Now, this is a nice uh, systematic review from McMaster where they looked at the evidence for aspirin. Unfortunately, uh, when it comes to aspirin desensitization, the studies are not very strong. Uh, on this meta-analysis, they were only able to find five randomized controlled trials um, to, to do the, the analysis. And a meta-analysis is when you pull data from different studies. All right. Um, there's a lot of dosing differences on this on the studies that they were able to pull. Um, particularly, one study was using a dose that we know it doesn't work. So for aspirin desensitization, the 325 milligram is the one that works the that we know that's the minimum dose that works, right? Twice a day. And then one of the studies had a low dose that didn't work, right? Um, overall, what they found is that there's an improvement on the nasal scores of 10 points. However, uh, there's also a, a increased risk of bleeding, right? And gastritis, inflammation of the stomach. So that's one of the side effects with the aspirin desensitization. One thing that I didn't see from the studies that were used on this meta-analysis is the use of anti-acids. Usually when I desensitize to aspirin, I keep the patient on a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor that decreases gastritis. However, that also raises questions. We know the PPIs or the anti-acids are not uh, benign long-term, right? So I haven't seen like a study where they looked at PPI plus aspirin desensitization long-term. But obviously, the rates of gastritis and especially a bleed can vary across studies. Uh, aspirin is a cost-effective measure. That's why we're still be, uh, using it. Compared to a new biologics, uh, the biologics work better. But aspirin is significantly cheaper. And that's what this study showed. Lastly, for biologics, um, these are monoclonal antibodies. Very briefly, the way you do it is you mix... Uh, uh, a special myeloma cells that make a lot of antibodies and immunize a mouse towards a target, a specific target of inflammation. You create these hybridomas that produce a lot of monoclonal antibodies. So these are specific antibodies that just bind to a specific path of that inflammatory cascade I told you about. And the ones that are approved for um, NERD, which are ones that need to treat both polyps and asthma, are dupilumab, mepolusimab, and omalusimab. Tesipelumab is ongoing trial, so we don't know yet, but these three are definitely approved. Unfortunately, we can't go through the evidence because we're running out of time, but um, we'll leave that for a, another time. Um, let me just go here. Now, there's another um, meta-analysis for this from the same uh, McMaster group that looked at the uh, at these papers or at the biologics. And they were able to classify improvement in quality of life based on the nasal scores, the visual analog score, the need for oral steroids, the need for rescue uh, surgery. And as you can see, they they could see the, the effects of different monoclonals. So these are the three that are 
um, approved. Um, and then aspirin desensitizations over here. So you can see the Pilima has uh, better outcomes across uh, five or sorry, six of the um, parameters that they studied, omalizumab two, mepolizumab one. Uh, but obviously a meta-analysis is pulling uh, information from different studies. They haven't been studied head to head yet. And I don't know if they ever will. For aspirin desensitization, um, the one thing you can see here, look at the adverse event rate, is the highest. And mostly it's because of the gastrointestinal issues. As I said, they use those five studies from before that didn't use the, the um, anti-acid prophylaxis. So I think that's why this, this is a, a lot higher. But again, the, the aspirin has a modest improvement, um, not as much as the biologics. I was part of, uh, with Dr. Tambua and uh, several allergies and immunologists uh, to come up with guidelines about the biologics. Uh, you can uh, find this article online. One of the big things that we discuss is who should be a, a good um, biologic candidate. These are great drugs, but they're very expensive. Um, these are some of the highlights of, the, of, of these consensus guidelines. Everyone uh, with nasal polyposis could be eligible but it should be reserved for patients who had adequate surgery. So that's the important part, having a good surgery within five years that failed medical therapy, right? And that's one of the consensus that we came through. But there's certainly a lot of good information on that paper for our patients. In the future, there's lots of um, clinical trials coming for different targets, as I listed here. The last thing is, I've been telling you a lot about T2 inflammation. Uh, ARD is T2, ARD is always T2. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, as much as a, a retrospective paper that looked at cytokine profiles on NERD. And yes, they found a, a cluster of um, high T2 inflammatory response, but they also found other clusters. There's one that had a lot of, um, you know, TH17, right? TH1 inflammatory response that uh, had a lot of polyps, and then a, a cohort that had no significant increases of any of the um, cytokines. And what's interesting is you can have the classic T2 cluster here that when you look at the polyp-free survival, so how many of them had polyps after two years, you can see right here that like by the two-year mark, more than 50% had polyps. But what's interesting is this new cluster that had non-T2 inflammation, right? The you know, uh, interferon gamma and uh, TH17, they actually did worse than the T2. So that's interesting. What's also interesting is the cluster one that had relatively low inflammation did well. And we know there's a couple of patients with NERD that actually just had the first surgery and they do well. Not a large amount, but a few of them can just had a good surgery and with nasal steroids, you know, maintain that for years. So obviously we're getting into the age of um, precision medicine. And uh, I think that that's an exciting time for ARD to realize that it's not a homogeneous disease, but there's different factors that affect it. Um, all right. Lastly, I think NERD needs to be a multidisciplinary uh, care disease. Um, I work with Dr. Tambu, which is a rhinologist, and we published this paper about a re um a referral pathway in British Columbia. Uh, as I said before, NERD patients are very complicated. They have a lot of issues with their asthma, their nasal polyps, right? The, the allergies to NSAIDs. They need to be in a subspecialized center if possible. These are some of the patients that we desensitize. We're very happy with the results. And uh, this is uh, our, our team. So in terms of uh, the last three tips, um, I'm almost done for patients. If you have an ERD, find an allergist that has an interest in an ERD. You can look at the Samter's trial website, ask around uh, and find someone who actually does NSAID um, desensitization. It's very important to find a good surgeon that uh, deals with mostly sinuses that does their subspecialty. So you don't have revision surgery after revision surgery. Having a respirologist is also helpful, but if, like, for example, myself, I deal with asthma, so I could do both, but sometimes you might need a respirologist on board to, to help you with that. It's very important you take your medication. There's a lot of lack of compliance. A lot of patients will come off their puffers, come off the nasal rinses, and then the polyps come back. You know, this is unfortunately a chronic disease, and you need to take your medications to decrease the inflammation. And lastly, I think it's very important to advocate yourself for access to biologics. 
um, across the country, uh, the biologic coverage is quite different. Um, I try to make a slide to kind of compare uh, all the um, access to pharmacare in the different provinces, but um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish it on time. I can tell you about BC, we have coverage for asthma only for two biologics, um, um, which are both IL-5 biologics and nothing for nasal polyps. And I think that um, for patients, especially with nasal polyps and Samter Strad, it's very important to create a pathway for pharmacare access because a lot of patients do not have extended health or the extended health will not cover the biologics due to the cost. Due to the cost. Perfect. So this is all I have. Sorry, I ran a bit over. Um, stop sharing here. Thank, um, you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ruiz. That was great. Very informative. And uh, you covered a lot of ground in a, in a short period of time. Um, so just on that last point about advocating for access to biologics, I think it's uh, just worth noting the fact that that is, that is among our priorities for Asthma Canada in terms of our advocacy program. We are actively involved in advocacy for access to a wide range of treatment options, including biologics for uh, treatment where, uh, where required and ensuring that people have equitable access. That's one of our main priorities. So we're happy to talk further with people about that and help people with their own self-advocacy issues. Uh, we do have um, a, a, a great group of volunteer advocates that help us with that work. If anybody's interested in joining it, please reach out to us. Uh, also wanted to do a, a quick um, plug here for our, our um, asthma and allergy uh, helpline. Uh, we do offer a free bilingual service. It's available either through email or phone, and that will connect you with one of our certified respiratory educators who are here to answer any questions that you might have or find information that you may not have access to. So just keep that in mind. We had some good questions come in uh, through the chat and in advance. So I'm just going to jump into a few of them here. Well, one thing, Jeff, before we go with um, advocacy, sure. um, coming up September 26th is uh, National uh, NERD Awareness Day. And yes. uh, that's why we're doing this seminar. Yes. If you look in the States, huge advocacy, lots of patients getting together. And I hope to create something similar in Canada. Our system's a bit different being a single payer system. Right. So the access to the medications, uh, I believe is a bit more difficult here in Canada than, than in the States. So um, I think it's important to create a national presence um, for patients to advocate for better access to surgical care, aspirin desensitization, biologics, because these are game changers when it comes to the management of, of um, NERD. Yes, thank you. And it's just noted in the chat as well um, that uh, we will be uh, highlighting AERD, or now we we'll start saying perhaps NERD <laughs> awareness uh, day next week. And, and we look forward to people participating. Please feel free to do that. Share it, share what we're sharing, share your resources and, and uh, your stories rather, and uh, check out the resources that we have. And, and certainly I think there's a lot of opportunities for advocacy as well. That we can do a much better job at in Canada. So uh, let's continue that conversation with you, Dr. Ruiz, and, and any of uh, the patients uh, that have joined us as well. So just uh, going to try to get in a few questions here. We've had some good ones come in. Uh, one of them was from uh, someone who was uh, mentioning that they have uh, had a long history with AERD, and uh, they've been on Nucala to uh, treat nasal polyps. They're doing well, uh, but sense of smell hasn't come back. So is there anything that you would recommend for people who are having issues with uh, having lost their sense of smell and, and where they might be able to turn for help? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, with the, with the sense of smell, uh, it's a tough one. Um, obviously, there's an anatomical changes with the nasal polyps. So, um, you know, revision surgery can help. When it comes to biologics and sense of smell, uh, most of the data for imp best improving uh, sense of smell comes with dupilumab. Uh, other biologics, so um, that's that's what we we've seen. Um, so that's something to consider. Obviously, sometimes uh, if you had many surgeries in the past, it could be a complication from a previous surgery, and the sense of smell will not come back. So, obviously, probably best to review with your um, ENT specialist, right, and your allergist or respirologist to see if maybe switching biologics is something you could consider revision surgery, or if this is longstanding, maybe your surgeon might tell you that it ha if it happened after a surgery, it could be that during the surgery when they're opening things up, there's always the risk of losing your sense of smell. 
Okay, thank you for that. And um, I'll just move into a couple other questions here before we close out. Uh, one person was asking if there's new research showing um, 81 milligram aspirin dose should not be taken preventatively due to potential brain bleeding. Are you aware? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not too sure. Uh, I'm not aware of any research on on that topic in terms of brain bleeding. For NERD, 81 milligrams is being shown not to help, right? So if you're taking 81 to help with the polyps and inflammation, it's not really going to do anything. You need to take at least 325 twice a day. That's the minimum dose. I like to go higher to 650 twice a day to start and then calm down. But uh, at 81 milligrams in terms of the benefit for your polyps, uh, there, there's none. There might be benefit cardiovascular in your, in your heart, right? And your arteries. And that's mm -hmm. it's a whole different discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Another person asked, uh, they point out that they have asthma and sensitivity to N NSAIDs, uh, causes a reaction of ch chest tightness and difficulty breathing uh, that is not responsive to Simbacort that they're using. Uh, there, his cardiologist advised to take, as we were just saying, 81 milligram of aspirin yeah. daily. Um, is there any concern with that um, in terms of, uh, he, he has, says he has been taking it daily, doesn't trigger an asthma attack, but could there be other effects or is there anything uh, in terms of dietary restrictions that might mm -hmm. involve as well? Yeah, no, that's, um, that's interesting. Obviously, like it's hard to to give medical advice, right, without seeing uh, yeah. the whole chart, but um, obviously like the, the, the presence of polyps is important, whether you have polyps or not, right? And if there's sinus disease, right, that would put you in a higher risk category. Um, the second thing we talked about was the dosing effect, right? Uh, as I showed you, some people might not react at the 81 milligram, but they could start reacting at the double dose, the 160, right? So if you're taking 81 and doing okay, I think it should should be fine. Definitely reassessing the asthma. Sounds like you're having issues, not well controlled with the Symbicord, so switching puffers, right? Addressing some of the other issues with asthma. Is it a matter of not taking the Symbicord enough? Is the Symbicord not working anymore? And again, you might need a different puffer. So there's other ways to optimize. Uh, I think at the 81 milligrams, um, as long as your asthma is is getting better controlled, uh, I think it's fine. But obviously, it's hard to to give strong recommendations without, um, you know, being in a, in a formal consult. But those are some of the tips I can give yeah, you. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, and we appreciate that. We're not uh, able to provide medical advice yeah. uh, specifically, but some good thoughts and things that people can bring bring back to their healthcare team to discuss. Uh, so we'll we'll just sneak in one more before we officially close off here, uh, and that is about you mentioned about uh, diet, lifestyle, and the role that those play. Uh, there was a question specifically about vitamin C, uh, mm -hmm. and whether that is uh, something that might help from a from a natural dietary standpoint. Um, I I'm not aware of, of of any studies. I haven't looked into it. Um, but I think if you take your regular dose of vitamin C, it should be all right. I definitely focus on the the studies that have looked uh, positive results, like the omega three high diet and low omega six. Um, but it comes with uh, vitamin C. I, uh, across my arena, I haven't come across any um, major studies yet. Yeah. What, there is one, I know I said last question, there's one that just came in. So I'll, I'll try and uh, ask if you can address this too. It's about uh, topical diclofenac and potential uh, problems, uh, whether or not this could, could uh, be a, a cause of problems as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it could depend. I mean, you have about a 10% absorption with topical diclofenac, right? So it, it, it could. Uh, I guess the question is why are you taking it? If it's pain, they might be better to go with Celebrex, right? Typically safer, right? Um, if you have a lot of pain and you need to take the, the topical version, then uh, I guess doing a, a threshold challenge might be something that I consider, right? So going to your allergies office, applying uh, an amount and being monitored and kind of noticing, okay, this is the, the amount that I can tolerate. Um, but I think the, the risk is, is is in the lower side just because it's not, absorption is, is not as much, right? And depending on the amount that you use, only 10% is getting absorbed systemically, right? Um, so that's, that's one that I would say, try Celebrex, that might be easier, right? Uh, and if you absolutely need to do it, then challenging it, to make sure that you're safe uh, at the dose that you're using, yeah.
Okay, great. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Ruiz, I want to thank you for uh, this very informative uh, session that you've uh, provided for us today. We're, it's such a pleasure for us to work with you, and we're so thankful for you uh, allowing your time and expertise and sharing all of that with us and addressing these questions as you have. So thank you for that. I uh, want to also thank uh, all of you who joined us uh, live and those that may be watching this recording at some point in the future. Uh, it's really important that we continue to provide these types of uh, programs and educational opportunities for patients and caregivers. And uh, we do that uh, independently. We are uh, an independent Canadian charity. Uh, it's because of the generosity of our donors. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, our sponsors and partners that we work with as well. So if you found this information useful, if you have uh, availed yourself of information through our website, we ask everyone to, uh, if possible, consider uh, Asthma Canada as a uh, making a donation to Asthma Canada to support our work. None of that is uh, dependent on making donations, but donations really do help us to continue to offer these types of services. So thank you for that. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to offering you future sessions. There'll be more information about what's coming very shortly. And again, thanks, Dr. Ruiz, and I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Perfect.